Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Bill Nye, a renowned science educator from the United States. Greetings, greetings, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. What's after excellencies? Very good errs. <laughs> Satisfactoryists. Uh, greetings. So, uh, I, as you may know, I'm from the United States. I'm a science educator, mechanical engineer. And I take uh, some pride in being from the U.S., and I also am deeply embarrassed in other ways. <laughs> and when it comes to climate change, I think the question on everybody, everybody in the world who is climate change on his or her mind, the question is, is the United States going to lead? Is the United States going to be able to make good on its promises uh, that it made at, the, uh, at COP21 in Paris? And so to answer that question, uh, we have the best person imaginable who will come up here to uh, talk with me and uh, answer your questions as best as I understand them. And she has been a, in the forefront of uh, fighting for climate change for a long time, decades. She understands the economies involved, the economics involved, and the people uh, who have uh, the various stakeholders involved in climate change that has to do with both um, manufacturing, ener energy production, and regular folk whose homes may be displaced. And uh, she is the world's foremost authority on what the United States is able to do. Please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming the uh, administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Ms. Jean McCarthy. So, uh, administrator. Your, your Excellency. <laughs> Mr. Science Guy. Uh, you signed, or uh, we, the United States, signed the Paris Agreement uh, three weeks ago. Yes. And uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, was involved in blocking or disabling the Clean Power Bill. Everybody's wondering, is the United States going to be able to deliver on its promises? Take yes, it. yes. I have no equivocation whatsoever. Uh, none whatsoever. <laughs> Bill, over the last decade, the U.S. has reduced more carbon pollution than any other nation in the world, and we are going to continue that pace. You know, that's why the, the president established a climate action plan. That's why the EPA moved forward with its rules. We have already taken considerable steps. We have plans ahead. And for crying out loud, what we have is a pause in the Clean Power Plan. If anybody knows anything about EPA and writing rules, we rock at it. We do them legally. We do them on the basis of sound science. And while there is a pause, there's no pause in the action in the United States towards renewable energy and energy efficiency. We are going in exactly the direction our rule demanded, and we're doing it because the market's demanding it. We could not be in better shape than we are today. Tell us how you really feel. That's it. <laughs> so what makes you say uh, the market demands it? Yeah, uh, well, basically, because if you look at how money is being spent, you will see that utilities are spending significantly more money on renewable energy and the delivery of energy efficiency than they are doing on fossil energy today. We know if you look competitively that solar energy is now competing. Wind, in many reasons, uh, regions, is now competitive. What you see happening, Bill, is that the United States have solutions to the future that they are investing in. So we're talking about solar energy being 12 times faster in terms of job growth than the overall economy is. Wind actually doubled last year than this, uh, in 2015 than it was in 2014. 
So we may be sending a long-term signal with the clean power plan, but we are not doing anything that's different than the direction that the energy transition is already heading. So when the market demands it, things happen. When we underpin it by regulation and send a long-term signal, that's when innovation happens as well. So we've been doing great. Solar's getting cheaper, wind's getting cheaper, efficiency's spreading out. We have new technologies. It's the future. It's what people want in this country, and we're going to deliver it. So are you saying you're going to deliver it despite the Supreme Court's trying to hold you back? Well, this, we will always pay attention to what the Supreme Court said, but if anybody... That's the law. It, it is, of course, <laughs> which is why we really actually should pay attention to it. But what they said was this. You know, they said that, that we're going to put a stay, which is a pause, while you work your way through the courts. Now, anybody that knows EPA also knows that any big rule we do ends up doing exactly the same thing. And so while people were real, really worried that momentum may wane, that is not the case. States are continuing to plan. They have written to us asking for us to continue. We just put out a, a rule uh, and sent it over for review so we can get it out called the Clean Energy Incentive Program, which is going to continue to send a signal to states about how we will implement this rule. But we're doing it all with, with great respect for the Supreme Court, knowing that they will weigh in. But, but uh, Bill, three times the Supreme Court has weighed in on carbon. Every single time they have respected the science and the law. We did too. We should have no problem getting through this. The only question we have is how fast is it going to move? And we can see that already in the market. It's faster than we ever anticipated, this shift to clean energy. It's, it's pretty exciting. Oh, businesses. Don't forget businesses. I shan't. <laughs> uh, businesses want clean energy? They sure do. Why? Because it's cheap, and it saves money, and, it, and they're worried about their business prospects. You know, I've talked to, uh, when you take a look at impacts from climate, businesses know what's happening. It's not just businesses that are international, but in the U.S. We have half of the Fortune 500 companies that are set greenhouse goals for themselves and are looking at ways of reducing it because they want to be part of the solution. If you look at some recent studies that we have, and, and I know you know this better than I do, but, the, but it's very dangerous to have an unstable climate. It's unstable oh, really? for the business <laughs> community. So when you're looking at, at uh, the future, I think the businesses know that the job growth is in areas of renewable and energy. We have 2.5 million people in the energy biz, clean energy business today in the U.S., and that's only going to continue to expand. Utilities are making that adjustment. They don't usually do it unless they have to, but now they do it because they have to because both us and the market is demanding it. And we have businesses stepping up saying we've got to do something about this. It's going to hurt my bottom line. It's a selling point, uh, like, a, for example, uh, we use organic produce and so on, and then consumers want that. They want renewable energy for, them, for their homes and for their businesses. But now let's say my understanding is there's 30,000 coal jobs in West Virginia. Well, for the, those of you not from the U.S., West Virginia is its own state, separate from Virginia, and uh, it's, uh, the whole place is a coal seam. And so what do you say to those people who are going to, if, if your policies, the administrator's policies continue, uh, those people will eventually not have jobs in the coal industry? What do you say? Well, the one thing, Bill, we know is that there's already a transition, and, and frankly, that transition happened in the 80s. And coal will be around for a while in the U.S., but the challenge we have is to, is to actually invest in those communities uh, today so that they can be better prepared than they have been for the future. Now, when you say invest, are you gonna, is this, these gonna be um, welfare checks to minors who are out of work, or do we have another bigger well, idea? The president um, put something together called the Power Plus proposal and submitted it to the Congress to take a look at in the past couple of budgets, and it really is considerable funding uh, to do job training, uh, to do reinvestment, I mean, one of the things that, that, that every state needs to have is an infrastructure that will attract business. Get broadband where it needs to be. That is a big push uh, in West Virginia and other places. So we need to understand that, that the market right now is saying that coal isn't competitive. It's saying it louder and clearer every, every day. What makes coal more expensive? 
Uh, well, uh, than wind or solar. Yeah, well, it, it, it's a competitive marketplace, and the market, you know, in, in a place where it's competitive, you're you're having prices that simply can't compensate coal for its cost, and that is because in West Virginia, in particular, um, they have all of the cheap coal has been already taken up. Mine. They, mine, yeah, and they are going deeper. It's more expensive. Um, also, coal is a a highly polluting system if you don't um, take care of that. So we are talking about more and more opportunities for fossil to have to invest in itself to reduce traditional air pollutants. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, reasons say, why coal is not competitive. Excuse me, but when you say traditional air pollutants, you mean yeah. things that aren't carbon dioxide, That's right. particulates and so on. Mercury, particulate mm -hmm. matter, um, oh, you know, ozone, uh, uh, well, and you have to handle and, those in conventional SOP, ways with BOC. bag houses or yeah. scrubbers and stuff like that, and it adds cost. It, it does. Yeah. It does. But, you know, I would, I would also say that we have seen a lot of the smaller facilities that aren't cost competitive uh, that have retired or are considering that because they don't want to continue to make the investments that are necessary for public health. But that's the choice of the market. We are, what EBA's job is to reduce pollution to the extent that it's available to us in a cost-effective way and to look at the economics of that and to look at the jobs and to be able to make the case to the American public. And we have made that case each and every time. But on the whole, what's happened is jobs continue to grow. What happens, though, is some communities may get left behind. You don't change the entire dynamics of the economics for those communities or deny they exist. You invest in those communities so they continue to have opportunities moving forward. So uh, in the case of West Virginia, just to dwell on that, or um, I guess you'd say central Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky's another commonwealth in the U.S. Uh, uh, do you want to, these are places that may not have internet even now in the 21st century. That's true. So is the proposal that the government, the U.S. government would uh, string lines there? Well, the U.S. government has been working to make broadband accessible across the U.S. This is a more directed proposal that really is at what you call that coal seam that takes a look at what communities actually need, uh, are reliant on coal, not just for individual jobs, but for the, for the viability of those communities and what other economic opportunities can be brought to the table. Now, we have not directed through that legislation what those answers need to be. We have identified the fact that there needs to be a few billion dollars dedicated to that effort, and we need to work with the communities themselves in the state to identify how best to make that transition. But to deny that transition is, is happening is to deny current economics and current market conditions. It's not going to get better without a clean power plan. It is happening and it's going to continue to happen. The choice is do we leave those communities behind and not invest in them or do we recognize reality and understand how we, they can take advantage of a clean energy future as well. So just one more thing on coal. <clears throat> I will say as uh, an engineer, I don't think there's, there's no way to burn coal without making carbon dioxide. Do you have an idea or have you worked with uh, representatives and senators to uh, negotiate with respect to uh, legislation with respect to clean coal? Well, we certainly have left open the idea that, that uh, carbon capture, use, and sequestration is possible. It's happening today. Um, and we've left certainly that opening to understand that that technology is available to new facilities. We what have not projected it. What sort of technology are you talking about? Well, we're talking about technology that can actually separate the CO2 out and reuse it or sequester it. How is that done? By freezing it? Getting it real cold? Oh, don't ask me engineering questions. Uh, God. Uh, I have tough right, well, let me questions ask you, with let the just, policy issues. Uh, let but, me ask you a policy question. No, that's your business. The, no, it's great. No, this is great. Uh, let me ask you a policy question. I actually have a degree in engineering. I just don't want to talk about it. Why, why don't you want to talk about it? Because it's kind of boring. 
It's a catalytic process, okay? I mean, there's many different ways of doing it, but you, you capture it, and there's a couple of different things that are actually happening in the United States. One is you transform it into, into producing chemicals that can be used. Another is you can like actually... Plastics. Yeah. And another is you actually can use it, which many are, for enhanced oil recovery. And you can pipe it to advanced oil recovery systems and use it for that purpose. And it helps to, to continue to make those less expensive and to sequester it. The real challenge for us was to develop an accounting system that ensured that it would, if it's sequestered, it is permanent. And so we have developed that system, and that's part of the regulation moving forward for new facilities. So you can rely on it, but right now we, we are really projecting that, that uh, the vast majority of CO2 that's generated from coal would not be uh, utilized for in enhanced oil recovery or for the production of other, other chemicals, but it would actually... Um, be sequestered. Yeah. yeah. All right, speaking of carbon... Uh, are you allowed to talk about a carbon fee? No, no, I can't. Yeah, of course I can. <laughs> we can chit chat and talk about anything you want. Just because we more cannot cold, call it a tax. We can't say tax. We have to say fee. <laughs> Do you have a feeling? Can you say of carbon the way I say it. Uh, I can say carbon. <laughs> there you go. I can park my car. All right, and then I'll talk about anything you want now. Uh, and uh, I will emphasize. <laughs> So what were we talking about? What were we talking about? We were talking about uh, uh, parking carbon <laughs> underground, uh, and we were talking about talking about uh, <laughs> All right, paying, now a you tax, get paying a tax <laughs> on the carbon. Okay, a carbon tax. I got it. You said fee originally. I, well, I was trying to. I was doing my best there, but uh, everybody <laughs> acknowledges that this would be. Uh, at one level, fantastically intrusive, where everything you ever do is, would somehow have a tax on it every time you use energy. But then the other thing, it would be, I, is my understanding, and please comment, it would be inherently fair, right? The people that make the most carbon, carbon, <laughs> would <laughs> pay the highest fee. And when you import something on a ship that pumps carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you got to pay a fee on that and acts like a tariff on imported goods and so on and so on. Well, Bill, uh, you know, there's, there's many ways in which you can put a price on carbon. I think regulation is one of them. Um, it, it, it is not across the board sector-wide available to us, in, in, I should say, in every sector. Uh, what do you mean president, by every sector? Well, we don't regulate every sector. We're not going to do with every sector what we did with the clean power plant uh, because it, it is, a, after all, a carbon pollution standard. It is not a fee. Now, the president spent a lot of time in his first term looking at whether or not you could do something broader through the legislature. That didn't happen. So the second term, we, we just uh, took a look at what authorities are available to, to us, and we're using them. That does not mean they're the most elegant of, of tools <laughs> available to us, but they are available. They're strong. They will work. They send signals. So and and, and in the future, there's probably going to be a lot more discussion about other tools available that Congress might want to take up. So two more things. So do you think that a tax would be more elegant than the regulations that you... Well, available? that is where I will not uh, yeah. comment. Because elegance is in the eye of the beholder. It is. Yes, it is. So well, how I do you... I actually think the clean power plant is pretty elegant. I think uh, greenhouse gas standards on light-duty vehicles is pretty elegant. I really like the idea of doing heavy-duty vehicles. I like hydrofluorocarbons. I like aircraft. I like methane reductions from oil and gas. All those, to me, are my elegant tools, and I'm making them available, and I'm working on them. That's great. <laughs> That's great. I know... Something that I've been working on lately with respect to climate change are the deniers. Are the deniers a problem for Where the... are they? <laughs> you know, I haven't met a lot of them here. It's weird. You think it would be their favorite place. Has it been a hassle for you? Is that part of your, tac your tactics? Uh, I don't think it's been a hassle. I mean, it's a lot quieter a debate than it used to be. You know, I, I, have, I do have to hand it to the president standing up and saying the science is not debatable. It really also doesn't hurt to have the pope uh, behind you. I'll, I'll take that any day of the week. If he were again me, I'd be in trouble with my mother. 
Uh, so I think, I think we're, we're doing pretty well, and I think we're making the case with science. You hear it, but not a lot. And the great news about the U.S. right now is not only has the energy sector turned a corner, and there are innovations and solutions today that we didn't have before, so the fight on economics is not there anymore. So you can keep talking to the climate deniers if you can find them, uh, but I think most of the time we're talking to human beings out there, and they know that climate is not just a threat today that they're feeling, but it's a threat to their ki kids' public health today and their future. And people in the United States want climate action. Most of the people, including in the states that are suing us on the Clean Power Plan, people want climate action, and they want us to regulate the fossil industry for carbon pollution. So you may hear a lot of buzz and a lot of people in telephone booths talking about climate isn't real, but don't go in those telephone booths and listen to real people. <laughs> I think everybody was given uh, this uh, study from the University of Maryland where you can see uh, where if the, uh, if the regulations were set up in a reasonable way, uh, people on both sides of the aisle would embrace it. This has just been fantastic. Thank you. Uh, well, we're out of time. You are a busy woman, you, and you work for me, man. I do. I'm a taxpayer, I'll do it every time. And you got a place to go. So I need a you. raise. Do you got one of those? <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Ms. McCarthy. It's great.